morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to ITIF's event on the 10th anniversary of the signing of the EGOV Act of 2002. I'm uh, Rob Atkinson, I'm president of ITIF, and uh, we have really two fantastic panels today uh, with people who were you know, principally responsible for the both the passage of the Act and its implementation. Uh, so what we're going to do, I'm going to introduce the first panel this morning. We'll go to just a, about 10 after 10. We'll switch to the second panel. I'll introduce them and we'll adjourn uh, right around 11.15. We should have plenty of time for questions for both panels. And uh, the panels are going to be completely uh, interactive. We're, we're not going to have any opening or presentations. So let me start by introducing the folks. Uh, to my immediate left is Bill Eggers. Bill is the Global Director of Public Sector Industry at Deloitte Research. Uh, Bill is a leading authority on government reform. He has seven books, uh, including the Washington Post bestseller, If We Can Put a Man on the Moon, Getting Big Things Done in Government, which was a Harvard Business Press 2009, Government 2.0, Governing by Networks, and the Public Innovators Playbook. Uh, he is also a former uh, manager of the Texas Performance Review and has uh, advised governments around the world. Kevin Landy is the uh, former Chief Counsel, Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs, where uh, with, when he was working with Senator Lieberman, who chaired that committee, uh, he was really instrumental in writing the Senate version of the EGOV Act. Uh, currently, Kevin is Assistant Director at U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, at the Department of Homeland Security. He's been, a, prior to that, was on the, um, uh, spent 14 years uh, on the Committee of uh, Homeland Security and Government Affairs and was the committee's chief counsel from 2007 to 2010. He also worked on other landmark legislation, including the implementing recommendations of the 9-11 Commission Act of 2007. Uh, Dan Chenock is the executive director of the IBM Center for Business of Government. He oversees the center's activity in connecting research to practice to benefit government. Previously, uh, Dan led consulting services for IBM public sector strategy. He serves as the chair of the Federal Information Security and Privacy Advisory Board and is vice chair of the Industry Advisory Council Executive Committee, IAC, uh, and as a CIO sage with the public, uh, with Partnership for Public Service. He also was in uh, OMB during the Bush administration where he led his staff uh, with the oversight of federal information and IT policy, including eGov, privacy, computer security, and budgeting. He has won numerous awards, including the 2010 Federal 100 winner for his work on the presidential transition. Uh, Congressman Tom Davis is a director of federal government affairs for Deloitte. In '94, uh, Tom was elected to the House. He's drawn, uh, he's also has drew on his past experience as general counsel of PRC, Inc., uh, and really to build a, a world-class reputation for expertise in procurement and IT issues. Uh, measures such as the Federal Acquisition Reform Act, the Services Acquisition Reform Act, and the Federal Information Security Management Act were all uh, under his leadership uh, when he was named the House Committee on Government, Chairman of the House Committee on Government Reform in 2002. And finally, Karen Evans. Karen is the director, National Director for the U.S. Cyber Challenge, uh, which is a nationwide talent search and skills development program focused on the, the cyber workforce. Before taking that position, she spent 28 years in federal government service, including uh, as the administrator for e-government uh, and information technology, in other words, the CIO at OMB, and uh, had a number of accomplishments, including related to IPv6, uh, uh, I love federal acronyms, HSPD-12, which as I recall was about digital signatures for the federal government. I'm, I'm it was implementing the 9-11 recommendations that Kevin worked on. <laughs> it's all a cabal. So, great panel, and thank you for all for joining us, and thank you. So, as I said, a decade ago we passed this act, the President signed it, and what did that act do? Um, well, I think it's important to recognize uh, that there were certainly e-government efforts before this. Uh, the, the, the Clinton administration had made efforts, uh, the Bush administration was making efforts. But the e-gov act solidified those, put many of them into statute, and also charged uh, subsequent administrations with doing new things. One of the things that, could, most importantly, it created the Office of Electronic Government in OMB, uh, which would be responsible for electronic information management and in promoting interagency cooperation to improve public services. 
As part of that task, uh, it created the CIO Council, which before that uh, there was cooperation among the CIOs, but never in a formal sense. It created an interagency EGA fund, so that there were, there were funds to build uh, cross-agency platforms and applications. And it created the position of EGA coordinator, which Karen has held, uh, which is essentially the, the CIO uh, position. It also, among other things, created a framework for accepting e-signatures uh, with the government. It created the Federal Information Security Management Act, which Arthur Davis was, was the lead person on in that. And it created a first gov portal, essentially a one-stop portal for, uh, uh, for uh, citizen access. So I want to start with um, uh, kind of where we got with that. I'm actually going to start before the act with Bill, because Bill, you were leading uh, President Governor Bush's efforts in Texas, so then during the campaign, I know that you were instrumental in uh, working with Governor Bush uh, on a number of issues, and I remember the day he announced uh, during the campaign, he announced his eGov initiative, which, I, I, which was yours, uh, and you had helped uh, write that. And one of the things it did is it, it was a proposal to create a CIO and also an interagency eGov fund. So you're going to kind of just spend a couple of minutes on kind of that background? Well, if I, I'm trying to remember, but if I recall, I think I actually stole some of it from you, Rob, at, at the time. Um, it was, uh, I was uh, essentially at the time, that, I think that was probably the last presidential campaign where one of the candidates actually talked about government management. Uh, if, if anyone remembers, President uh, then Governor Bush gave two speeches on management issues, uh, one in uh, Nashville and one in Philadelphia, and they dealt with all whole, everything from the, the number of political appointees and the titles to all sorts of kind of more wonky management issues, and they were both, you know, I think around the notion of the CEO business type, but also um, in Texas we did have something called the E-Texas Commission and it was a pretty big initiative where we were looking at how do we become, you know, one of the better states around e-government and there's a lot of people involved and not a lot of uh, volunteers and, and so forth. And so the e-government, uh, some of the proposals for the fund, the CIO, and, and so forth. Again, I, if I recall, Rob, you had a you had this study uh, around that, and so we were you know stealing good ideas from from anywhere, and this one was actually originally yours. So it is all a cabal, I, I, I guess. And um, I so it was it was really one part of it, but it was the, the notion of can could we make you know the federal government much more you know better, faster, cheaper through. Uh, through e-government, and at the time there was a, a real belief not only in the productivity gains that could be get, but also through some of the transformational uh, elements of, of e-government at the time. So we, we wrapped in, we did, I think the original idea was for a $250 million uh, fund, which got cut down just, just a tad, or pretty radically in, in the end, for those of you who remember the during the legislature. So it didn't quite... Um, get up to to where we wanted but at least i guess it was the first it was probably the first time a candidate had talked about e government in the presidential campaign and from from there you know kevin and crew then took it up great thank you so, kevin so then you're in that situation where you're seeing there's uh, the white house doing some things you're seeing the importance of it senator lieberman is uh, how did you then go about to the get to the act itself <clears throat> well, there, there were already some sporadic efforts throughout the government. Uh, Firstgov.gov had started with the contribution of the search engine during the latter end of the um, Clinton administration, which was going to lead to the first government portal. Um, uh, starting in late 1999, early 2000, uh, Senator Lieberman um, launched an online interactive tool which allowed people for the first time to comment on uh, 44 different ideas for the government, which provided an initial basis for our efforts. And then uh, Senator Lieberman in May of 2001 introduced the e-government act, which I think there were, there were two central aspects to it. One was, I think, the, the core notion we all think of when we think of e-government, streamlining um, access by citizens, for citizens to information and services. Um, breaking through agency stovepipes so that the information is organized according to the needs of the citizen, not according to the organization of the agency. And in order to effectuate that, you need uh, centralized, uh, effective leadership uh, coming out of OMB. And for that, the uh, e-government act legislation 
uh, created a very strong uh, chief information officer position at OMB that would have extraordinary powers to um, lead uh, intergovernmental efforts. Uh, that's difficult to do in this town because the agency paradigm is very powerful and because Congress as well is organized um, in those links. So um, in, the course, in the course of ongoing negotiations, with which, um, which Dan can describe as well, we were trying to find the right balance between um, the, what, was, what we were aspiring to and then what was doable. Great, thank you. Um, Dan, you then, in some sense, uh, were the administration's person working closely with the House and the Senate as these bills were being uh, crafted. Can you describe that process and what you were thinking, what you were trying to get done? Sure. Well, the, uh, as a career, um, sort of the SES are in charge of the information policy branch at OMB, which before the EGOV office was the office where all the IT work was, was done. Uh, it was basically the Bush administration came in, and the deputy director of OMB, Sean O'Keefe, um, actually called me into his office and said, Senator Lieberman's going to introduce a bill. We think that you, as the career staffer responsible for this, would be the right person to talk to the staff in the Senate and work with the House as, as the House is working through this. Uh, and basically represent the administration and come back. And I think it was important that they looked at a career leader uh, to do this because they were taking sort of a long view and trying to see what would be uh, a set of, of issues, as Kevin said, that you, we could work on that would try to find balance in, in a number of ways. And, and um, a number of activities that were ongoing, as Kevin described, the first Gov portal, there had been a lot of work on digital signatures uh, that had been going on for several years. Of course, the Bush administration created the position of the e-government administrator, uh, which Mark Foreman held. Actually, at the time, I believe it was called the associate director uh, for e-government um, uh, until the statute passed. Um, and then, uh, of course, the Federal Chief Information Officers Council, as well as a number of the um, uh, e-government initiatives. All of those were in the mix as we worked through these various issues that were in the Senate bill, and we tried to find where are things where codifying these ongoing activities, locking them in um, for the future would be uh, advantageous to the government and would help the country uh, in various ways. And so that was kind of the role that, that I played as I worked through with Kevin, and we uh, worked with, in addition uh, uh, to, um, to the House and to Congressman Davis' staff, uh, we worked with GAO, with uh, then Dave McClure, who uh, now is in the administration uh, at GSA, and also with Senator Thompson's staff, with Robert Shea, who of course was in the administration, um, uh, in the Bush administration. So the cabal expands uh, as, the, um, as the players uh, work through these issues and uh, work through, as Kevin said, the summer of 2001 and into, into uh, uh, the fall as we uh, move toward trying to get to a bill that would, that would be passable. Great, thank you. Congressman David, you, Dave, you were involved in this, I know you held a number of hearings and you had been thinking about a number of these, including cybersecurity. You want to describe sort of how that played out in the House? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Let me first start the part of my resume you left out that I'm most proud of, so, is because I left Congress undefeated and unindicted. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I was not uh, chairman of the full committee. I was just a subcommittee chairman, but it was information manager. I was also chairman of the House Republican Campaign Committee. Uh, I was lucky to have some very good partners. Senator Lieberman, uh, Congressman Turner, uh, on the House side, also played lead roles on that. My staff, uh, Director Melissa Wojcik. Um, so it was a good group to kind of put politics aside for that. Something even in those days uh, was not the uh, normal place. Uh, we liked Senator Lieberman's bill uh, as it got shaped over the Senate, and worked with the administration. A couple pieces we really added on the House side that were important to us. Bills we try to move kind of freestanding before and to vet some kind of some obstacles along the way. Uh, one was FISMA, uh, Federal Information Security Management Act. Uh, it's uh, been a landmark act. I, frankly, it needs some updating now. This was 10 years ago. At that point, we had no protocols for uh, what agencies were doing on cyber protections at all. There was no checklist, no nothing. Uh, just increasing cyber attacks, and FISMA uh, set the first protocols down. Now, if you ask the average member of what FISMA is, I think it's a new COLA or something like that. So this was kind of below the radar screen in terms of what most members wanted. The irony here is I think that's the last major cyber bill we had. For the next decade, this has been tied up with jurisdictional battles, uh, privacy battles uh, between uh, uh, different agencies, different committees of jurisdiction, and nothing has happened, even though the problems continue to mount. Uh, but FISMA, we think, was a good, giant first step at the time uh, that we were able to load into the uh, bill that I think has, has, uh, been, has been very helpful. 
Um, the second is we added something called SARA, the Services Acquisition Reform Act. Had some ideas that uh, I was happy. One, it had a lot of share and savings contracts, something I've always been keen on. Uh, this allows uh, companies to come to government and say, we're going to save you money and you don't pay us unless we can show the savings. Uh, there's tremendous resistance to this by the uh, appropriators, tremendous resistance to this on the part of uh, the, some members, but we were able to load that in at uh, a five-year expiration at that point, but uh, I think it proved it proved its worth. Um, it also brought some commercial practices into uh, IT buying. So loading that in, we thought, was an important piece uh, as well. It's often overlooked when you talk about the e-government act. And then the other items, the CIO council and the like, were long overdue. But we had great partners. I mean, I think everybody kind of parked their cars and hats and just said, we're going to work together. And everybody kind of worked goodwill shows what can happen. It uh, didn't get uh, loaded until the closing days of the Congress. But uh, it was really a good group effort that I think, uh, you know, 10 years later has, uh, they say, survived the test of time. Great, and hopefully a model for moving forward with bipartisan, bicameral cooperation. Karen, you were, um, the, the bill created the CIO, which Mark Foreman uh, led, will be on the second panel, but then you were uh, Mark's predecessor. Um, do you want to describe, and, and you were involved right at the time, when this, start, when this got handed to you, and the president signed it, what were you all thinking about, and how did you see uh, your role in implementation? <coughs> At the time, I was the uh, Chief Information Officer at Department of Energy, and I was also the Vice Chair of the CIO Council. So from the CIO Council perspective, so I was the career counterpart to, to Mark as the, the Director or the Chair of the CIO Council. We were excited because what it did was codify the roles and responsibilities of what the CIO Council was supposed to do, and that was the forum where you were trying to get things done in advance before they were dictated to you from OMB. And so the idea was is that it was a, would be a really good exchange between the agencies and the Executive Office of the President about how to go about doing some of these government-wide initiatives. And also at the time, and one of the key things that I think Dan kind of touched on this a little bit was there was a big government-wide task force that um, Mark had launched under his leadership through the uh, Office of Management and Budget. And what that task force, it's, it's finally called the Quicksilver Initiatives, but what that task force really did was really engage the political leadership at that point when they first came in. And, and that was very exciting because what happened was there were groups of people that went around and ask the political leadership in each and every department, what are the key things that you want to get done in your tenure during this administration that involve information technology, that would change the business processes of your department? What do you think you can get done? And from that, launched what we call the Quicksilver Initiatives, which were the 24 eGov initiatives, um, and then launched into the longer term types of things. But there were certain parameters around that, and it got everybody energized and going in the same way. The, the eGov Act itself codified a lot of that. And, and put that in place and then put structure around it to say, okay, now you have to go forward and here are, here are the authorities that you have now to go and implement these cross-agency type of initiatives. I will tell you that once it was handed to me when I um, moved up, and I didn't actually agree to take the job, I know the president asked me, but one of the big questions was with Dan Stay. And so um, Dan did stay to help with the transition, so that's, he was very key to the success of the transition between Mark and myself. But it, it's a, it was overwhelming because of all of these responsibilities that were in the act. There were a lot of them. Um, there were uh, a lot of expectations and promise from the act, and we had to deliver. So it, it was a lot of work that the CIOs and the agencies did. Yeah, if you if you go online and search for the eGov back in 2002, which I did this weekend, one of the things that documents that comes up was a OMB document that listed all the responsibilities and where you what, what kind of progress you were making on them, and it was a long, long. It's list. a memo that's this thick that I still have that's all tabbed and color coded that Dan wrote that we were to implement across the government. I got it as an agency, and then when I went in, I mean, we, there are specific timelines that Kevin and his 
team outline for things of making information available and um, I was researching it going back because somebody just asked me a question this past week about community technology centers can you and, and asked about I know this is in the EGOVAC somewhere and I went and searched that and there were tons of reports that were out there about the di digital divide and how to make information accessible and a lot of the same challenges that we talk about today are being talked about 10 years ago it's the technology and the access that has changed so uh, the challenges are still there some of the and a lot of the policy issues are there they're just now getting accelerated because of the improvement in technology yeah one of the things that's it's so easy to overlook when that act was passed is we had fewer than about eight percent of americans on broadband there was no 3G network, much less a 4G network. The iPhone was five years away. Uh, we didn't have Web 2.0 or social networking. I mean, we were pretty antiquated, really, when you think about where we are today. But I think the, the visionaries saw that more law would continue and, and what, what it would do. So I want to start, uh, ask Kevin, but anybody can just jump right in on this. Where do you think we've made the most progress uh, on the act? What, what's been the biggest benefits uh, over the last decade? Um, well, just to uh, uh, address that by discussing a little bit more of the structure of the legislation itself, uh, the parts that Senator Lieberman worked on um, had, was uh, Titles 1 and 2. Titles 1 um, addressed the uh, reorganization of government in order to drive the government, especially with OMB. So the creation of the administrator of the government office now um, also considered the chief information officer was really important to driving that driving those initiatives uh, there were different agencies working on different pieces but somebody had to make sure that they all started moving together the e-government fund could have been um, a much more important part of that it did receive funding over the years but um, uh, greater amounts of funding would have ensured greater interagency successes. Um, but Title II had a lot of individual pieces, which was which did give um, Mark and, and Karen a lot to do all at once. Um, and some of those pieces uh, uh, got at the concept of single websites that when a, when a citizen went online, he or she didn't have to know which agency he was interacting with. And it was multiple agencies. The USAGov.gov is the best example. Um, Regulations.gov was a requirement that all agencies conduct their online rule, conduct their rulemakings online um, in a single place. Um, uh, one thing that uh, is, is necessary for people to trust the government is that they trust that the privacy of their personal information will be protected. And, um, the Government Act required that privacy impact assessments be um, drafted and posted online every time that there's going to be a new information collection. Uh, so um, th there was a provision on uh, requiring federal courts to provide greater online accessibility. Uh, those were, uh, uh, Title II addressed so many different things at once. Um, and and I, I would say that, that combination of uh, a, num a number of those individual initiatives and requirements in Title II really drove the ball forward by requiring government-wide action and um, the government administrator provided the leadership to ensure that would happen. Yeah. I would uh, expand on Kevin's points. Because of, of the introduction of FISMA uh, into this overall statute, it created for, on the privacy impact assessment it basically a framework for security and privacy to enable information technology advances as something that was core in the same statute. So it wasn't like you had a security law over here and then an e-government law over here. They were really seen as part of an overall information technology whole. Related to that are the policy, and Karen alluded to this, underneath the agency activities. And one of the sort of unsung elements of the EGOV Act was, uh, I think it was Section 207 was the information policy, or 208, it was one of those two. 208 was privacy. 207, 207, yeah. 207 um, which had a whole range of information policies that OMB developed over the course of the next two years that it still to this day are basically a, a lot of the policy framework. So, a number of the infrastructure from security and privacy to information policy that basically dri now drives the innovation agenda and allows it to go forward in a positive way really had their birth for the government in, in the government act and how that came together. Okay. I, I would like to follow up a little bit more on the actual execution of this. So Congressman Davis actually talked about and, and brought up the procurement piece. 
So that actually really was very helpful as we move forward too because there were new authorities that were given that extended out to state and local governments as well. And based on us being able to do that because of these things that were in Title II, for example, one of them was recreation.gov. And so it was saying that people ought to be able to experience what they want to do across the nation, you know, put it in and be able to pick up state and local and federal government. But what that also did was force this integration down between state and local governments, which was envisioned through part of the procurement. And then what then happened was we were able to start crafting procurements around the fact that we could leverage requirements around a certain business area that was also federal, state, and local. And then it expanded it out because based on things that Dan's talking about, um, from a security perspective, we could then leverage things like standard configurations. And there were things that we did directly with state and local governments that allowed for encryption and things like that to happen. And we would have never been able to do that if the authorities and procurement authorities weren't integrated into the EGOV Act. So the EGOV um, administrator had a lot of authorities from planning and budget and recommendations all the way through execution with procurements, which was really great because it was with one person within OMB that allowed you to use all these authorities to make agencies move in the same direction, but then also talk to their state and local government counterparts. Let me pick up on that. Under the Federal Acquisition Reform Act, uh, there was originally going to be a congruity where you could take the schedules, uh, the federal schedules, and use them at the state level. But every year, uh, different groups would come in, uh, people who like selling to their state government didn't want this stuff to go national and they would come in and buy their way in and buy off a member of the Appropriations Committee and they would defer it uh, for two years at a time. Uh, what we were able to do is apply this to the 70 group schedule. So for, the, for IT products, build a congruity of products uh, up and down. It not only, I think, saved money for state governments if they adopted it, and many of them did, uh, but it brought a congruity, if you will, uh, between those products up and down the line, which is so, more so so piped anyway that it's difficult to do. And we settled on that. We would have liked to have made this broader, but there was tremendous operation from groups and companies that have monopolies selling to certain state governments. They didn't want to open up the process uh, across, across it. So we fought that, but we kind of snuck this in. I think it's been very helpful. Okay. That's what happens, like I just said, when you drop this stuff in at the last minute. If we kept this thing hanging out there for six months, the bill would have been dead. If they were dropped in. Yeah, there is an advantage of uh, stealth. Yeah. Um, so, I want to we talked we talked a little bit on, uh, on on productivity, and I want to ask start with Bill on this. Um, in my view of this, we we've done a lot of amazing things, but they've all sort of been top line, I think, and the bottom line, I think, in my view, has been less. And in part, um, I think it's been hard to re-engineer government, in part because of the OPM. Uh, uh, rules and the in inability to lay workers off and to transform work. But I would just like people to comment on that. And how much have we really done in terms of cost savings? And cost savings principally driven by productivity. You can get productivity two ways. You can you can eliminate work or you can eliminate waste. And perhaps we've done more of the latter. Bill, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I'm actually, I just finished a, a study on that. We haven't even talked about that. But I, uh, where I was looking at technology and productivity and in fact looking at mobile, and the, the numbers are actually pretty discouraging. Um, at the same time, when private sector productivity has increased around the mid, up until the mid 1990s, <coughs> the rate of the productivity increase was pretty close between the public and private sector. And then it started to diverge around the late 1990s, and it's continued to diverge to the point where, when you look at Census Bureau data and others, and other data, is actually public sector productivity has declined. Um, over the last decade, and private sector productivity has increased about 3% or so a year. So you've seen a big divergence, which has occurred. Um, and so, we've, you know, I think the hope back then was that, you know, be, this would lead to significant cost savings. It was always hard to figure out exactly how to get the cost out. But I think a number of things happened. Uh, well, first of all, obviously, with the, the huge increases in, in the budget over that time, the the pressure for cost reduction was just not there to any great extent. I think there's also a lot of putting lipstick on a pig sort of thing going on where um, instead of instead of replacing uh, 
more manual processes and more in replacing, I would call more industrial age processes. They were, we just put the digital um, kind of Hollywood storefront over it. And so, um, so they weren't replaced at all, so you didn't end up with that sort of productivity benefits. Um, and this is also the case in the UK where they've also seen that sort of divergence. So when you look at the biggest difference between productivity, um, public and private sector over the last decade, it's just one word, it's technology, where the private sector has been much better at being able to harvest the, ben the, the productivity benefits of technology to actually take costs out, and take costs out in a pretty radical way. And that, that just hasn't happened here. I do, I actually, I hold a little bit more hope uh, for mobile in this regard. I actually think mobile has an opportunity to be a little bit more transformative just because people will interact more, I think, more with government, and I think we've gotten smarter about that sort of thing. Um, but we, we really have to start closing down systems and closing down existing systems, which simply I don't, I don't, I don't think happened to a great extent. Right, can I pick up on that? i just give you my experience having been a county executive before I came to, uh, to Congress as well. You know, agencies focus on their agency budgets. And productivity increases mean lower budgets for those agencies. It is just the nature of man that people do not like to, uh, you, you get your savings and you don't get the benefit of those savings. They go to somebody else who maybe isn't doing the same kind of thing. So the nature of government makes this very, very difficult without some strong leadership at the OMB level in government. And you know how tough that is. Uh, in the private sector, it's the exact opposite. You start making savings, you know, you're more competitive, you make more money. So the incentives are very, very different. And uh, that is one of the reasons, you know, it is still going on in government, I can give you chapter or verse, of where people come in with ways to uh, software testing improve significantly uh, on, on, on savings and productivity. There's just resistance at the bureaucratic level because they say, well, this cuts my, my budget. This will cut my people. What do I do to protect them? And, and there's no benefit to those particular agencies, even though there's an overall benefit to government. I just I can come back, uh, Cardinal, just on that point. But isn't that partly also a, a function of the appropriations committees? And if they had sort of like a five-year budgeting where they could say, if you guys, if you're an agency or a division, you cut costs, we're not going to take it all out of your hide. We'll we'll give you, we'll let you keep a little bit of that maybe for well, standard yeah, but things. Remember the approach. Uh, you, you got 12 different appropriations, and they there's not a lot of coordination between us. So each appropriation, they get their uh, what's called their 502B allocation. Uh, that's what they get to spend in that, but any savings they make, uh, they don't get to spend in their own area, too. So it's across the board, it's just the way government acts and the way it says so far. Well, and, and the other thing here is the way the reward system works, and, and everyone knows this, is if you find a team within government that is very productive and very innovative, the way that they're rewarded is you give them more work, you give them more budget. And so the way that people look at successful teams here in, in the government is, is if you have a bigger team and you have a bigger budget, that means that you've done really, really well and they're giving you things that could necessarily be out of scope. Um, and, and so that incentive system really has to change. And, and again, this could be my rationalization because the ECA fund never did get a lot of funding um, under my tenure. Like, I think the highest we ever got was $3 million. Um, which was pretty exciting. You're not, you're not bitter about <laughs> and it. Right? I'm not. But, and it could be my rationalization about performance from that perspective. But we did learn about you know, a lot of other tools that have forced us to learn how to make the agencies work, learning how to work with Congress, how to make all these other budget tools that, and management tools that OMB had at its disposal to be able to use those efficiently. And there's another point that Bill brought up that we started to track toward the end. You, everybody is all excited about the gear up for the new stuff, and they forget that you still have to deliver services, um, existing services. And so the agencies aren't let off the hook about how the services are delivered. They have to deliver the services. So if you don't cut over, you don't do the project management real well, there is a point, and this is the promise with all technology, there's a blip or a point on your productivity that shows that costs actually have to increase because you're running old stuff and new stuff at the same time. And the key is shut the old stuff down. 
and we started tracking shutting down the old stuff and you see this administration doing it now with the consolidation of the data centers and tracking the actual shutdown of those and managing those costs so that you can show uh, the true savings. If you don't shut down the old systems, you are never going to realize the benefits of the new ones. And, and just to continue on that path, drawing a parallel from the quick cycle work to actually some work that the current administration is doing in terms of how to make productivity change happen, um, is a small group of committed, dedicated, and skilled staff can make a lot happen. That's basically the Quicksilver Task Force, as you mark uh, here, uh, brought together on basically 24 of these teams. And a lot of change happened as a result of Karen was a member uh, uh, and a leader on, an, on a number of those teams. Uh, and now you're seeing in the current presidential innovation fellows that the current administration is uh, working are also working with sort of cross-agency teams of skilled, dedicated staff to, to make real innovation happen in the government. And I agree fully with Congressman Davis and Karen that you need to have basically leadership and a governance structure to lock it in, but you also need that, that dedicated change because otherwise their, the career staff will basically just look and say, here's another change initiative coming down from on top. So you need to basically have it working at both levels. Yeah, I guess I, I see the I see in, in government that it, it is a lot easier <clears throat> to do top line innovation. It's, it's fun, it's exciting, we can get a team, and these are largely what the innovation fellows are doing. And it's pretty cool stuff. But slogging down in the basement to uh, to get rid of a you know forty uh, uh, GS sevens uh, in a program uh, that's really really a lot harder. We don't get rewards for it; you get resistance for it. And I'm just wondering if, if um, you know, what what would be like one thing you would suggest? I mean, I, I, perhaps it goes back to Bill's point: just better publications of uh, better publication of productivity data. BLS, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, used to do a very good job of tracking agency productivity. Now they don't. And maybe we just did that, and and we have all of these these awards that OMB does for agencies. Uh, you know, the best cybersecurity, the best of this, and we should, it seems to me we should have an award of the best productivity. I would say that um, if you take a look, the, the Quicksilver initiatives, you know, later the presidential management initiatives, there were a couple things that were really key about that. And the parameters were set around that they were supposed to be short-term deliverables, things that made sense. So one of the ones that if you looked at it today, you'd say, holy smokes, and they're getting ready to recompete it, is travel. All the government, the government does travel. You know, you had the whole big growth coming out of Expedia, and now you have Kayak. You have all this stuff to, to uh, compare rates and everything else like that. Um, that. That would seem like that would be really easy. And the other thing that seems like would be really easy is like you could then compete it and get a commercial service in and do the, the adaptive piece of um, government travel. What ends up happening, and you know, I know we're not going to solve this, is, is that as GSA went along and did that procurement, um, the environment that we're in, because it's highly competitive for this federal space, the benefits weren't also were not achieved and therefore affect productivity because um, vendors protested the award of one vendor. So we had to split it. And, and based by splitting it, it went to two different other contractors who had great sales teams but then couldn't really implement it. And so, you know, the whole idea of trying to get it and then the benefits and the productivity and everything else that you're trying to get, all these other external forces came and drug it out and it had a split. Um, that's one example. The other one, payroll, which seems like, wow, that'd be really easy too. There's all this manpower stuff out there. Okay, well, every agency had a payroll function. And the idea was consolidate it down. Um, you'd be able to do it, you know, and then maybe we could outsource it out. I know that's a bad term right now, but we could have sent it out um, because it's a, a function that maybe the government didn't really need to do. There are things that happen within the government that are a little bit different than in private industry. Um, for example, we ran into a whole slew of things that thought it would be really easy until we had to get into the agreements at the VA Center about how do you do payroll with doctors and, and all this. They, they have a big exception. Um, the other thing was how do you do payroll for intelligence agencies. They have a whole big exception about how their stuff is done. And so you can get an 80% solution, which should, you should implement 
while you're working out what that last 20% is that's different in the government. And, and a lot of times, maybe that last 20% isn't necessarily cost effective, which would then um, show that we're not as uh, you know, productive as private industry, because there are some nuances in the government, and that's the nature of government. Rob, I think that the biggest change, I think that would have the most powerful, we've seen other countries have productivity dividends, like in Australia, where they change has to give back uh, 3% a year, and, but I think that people can gain that a lot. I, I think what would have the biggest impact would be if you had complete transparency around, uh, around the costs of a lot of the processes where maybe you spend X amount of money doing some real benchmarking around processes and how much they cost. Put that out there in a very transparent way and then let people other let people kind of bid on how much they can do it. Because I look at I look at what's happening in the legal profession now and I just said it's it's so amazing. It's e-discovery thanks to e-discovery. Uh, computers can do the work of now 500 lawyers, what it used to take. Now, in the legal profession, there's a big incentive is you're billing out per lawyer. Like, you don't want to go that direction necessarily, but there's both competition and there's transparency around it where people can see others doing that, so they really have no choice to do that. And, and you know, we're not doing that same sort of thing right now, right now in government. I mean, even in the e-discovery area, that's a... You know, an area for tremendous, tremendous cost savings. So I think if you put it all out there, made it very transparent, benchmark what those were, then you would start to force, I think, some of that change a little bit more. Bill, we had the A76, as you know, and that was a way where you take governmental functions and go out and bid them out, but they Congress and their ultimate wisdom or, or whatever. But they're bid out, the problem with A76 is that they're bid out to do do this process the same way we're doing it today, but for a little bit less money, as opposed to rethink how to actually get to Except that goal. Except the, the result of the A76 process is, is when government had to compete with the private sector, they would often come in and innovate because they wanted to keep the job and they won 75% of the jobs. That's, that, right. that, that, that's really what happened. I, I, yeah, I think this conversation shows that e-government means a lot of different things. It means different things to different people. And we've, we've, we're, we're not really talking about the e-government act anymore, which is, um, which is fine. We're talking about a much, much larger problem, um, which is even beyond government IT. We're talking about um, making government more efficient here. Um, Klinger Cohen, which preceded the e-government act um, in the 90s, was intended to uh, ensure that government IT programs um, uh, was were less wasteful, that spending was rated in and better managed. Uh, E-Government Act built on that to an extent by creating an administrator who could do either thing. Um, and by, uh, but the, a principal purpose of the E-Government Act was online innovation as opposed to just IT management. So the government administrator, now the CEO, <coughs> finds him or herself trying to do both things, doing a better job managing government IT, but also trying to spur um, innovation and the spring innovation part you're not no you're not going to figure out how to shut down legacy systems and save billions of dollars with with some of the provisions of that bill um, some of the provisions in that bill were essentially democratizing government um, which is uh, provide in, in, a, in a way that is very inexpensive providing information and services to citizens so that their government um, becomes something real to them um, you, you do you do have problems about well who's working in the basement and, and can we do that more efficiently? But now now when you have um, Americans who can go to first doc, firstgov.gov or who can go to regulations.gov.gov um, uh, uh, and and see so this now I understand how to access the regulatory process or now I know the single place to go and find out about grants um, uh, or benefits. Um, or recreation. Uh, in a way, it's, it's doesn't, it doesn't take billions of dollars off of our appropriations legislation, but in, in some ways it achieves real savings in terms of making people realize what their taxpayers, uh, what their taxes are going for. Yeah, so let's jump into that for a second because I think that's a really, um, that's a good point, Kevin. We've certainly made some progress, I think, on I mean, the vision of the, one of the visions of the bill was a more customer-centric uh, government experience, and we've certainly made progress. We've heard a number of those, um, recreation and, and regulations and, and the like. Um, but I don't think we've done it all. Uh, there's still, to me, an enormous amount of uh, stove piping. Um, one example, if you want to find out what technologies are available at the federal labs, there's no one 
integrated safe place you can go and put in, I'm looking for optics technology, show me all <coughs> optics programs in the entire federal laboratory system. That doesn't exist. And that's just one thing. So we've made some progress. I wonder if folks could talk about where you think the most progress has been made on moving to more customer-centric as opposed to stoked by bureaucratic-centric. And then perhaps are there other areas that we could make more progress in? Let me make a, just a comment on where you can make more progress and something I think is really helpful is administrations are elected. Basically, uh, they have the law. They have to carry out the laws of Congress and, and the like is just give the administration's permanent reorganization authority. Every president had that until Reagan was taken away from him uh, by a Congress of the opposite party. Uh, the, and I know this administration would like it if they have to go to a Republican Congress. But all this does is it allows administrations to come in, take a look at how things are operating, and bring about those consolidations and changes they think are necessary, <laughs> basically to pursue the ends of government. And then it comes back to Congress and is voted up or down, and this is critical, without amendment so that you don't get into all the jurisdictional battles that usually make it difficult, like with Homeland Security and the like, where everybody's worried about losing jurisdiction. And you start designing this uh, thoroughbred of a horse, and you end up with a three-hump camel by the time all the congressional fingers say, uh, get into it. I mean, that overall puts the ball in an administration's hands, where they can then look at this to figure out how they have to reconfigure it and gives them permission to do it. They need congressional uh, attention to do that, but uh, they would be able to design it their own way. That, that's what makes this so difficult, is you have so many fingers in the pie as these things move forward. Right. And I think um, to take the administration sort of view across even the last 20 years, the, your question has been one that's been addressed since in the Clinton administration, the Vice President's National Partnership for Reinventing Government, looked for how do we re remake government around customer-centric um, uh, organization, the e-government initiatives that, that, that we've been speaking about were a number of those were taking the same view. The e-government act kind of codified that in, in terms of how the government should operate. And now the current administration, looking at these innovation uh, agenda uh, elements, President Management Fellow Projects, as well as the cross-agency uh, priority goals that were uh, the subject of the new performance.gov website that just came out at the end of last week. All of this basically is moving toward doing a very hard thing, as we've talked about, as several speakers have talked about, working across agencies, working across boundaries, congressional lines, interest group lines, is very difficult. It was difficult in the 90s, it was difficult in the last decade, and it's still difficult. And so it takes a lot of effort, a lot of action from individuals to do things like make regulations not going happen, make travel happen. And you've seen a number of those initiatives that basically are now part of the fabric of government and have kind of been picked up built into the base, if you will, um, and are not seen as these new novel innovations, but have achieved a life cycle that they're now part of the regular budget. They don't make the daily headlines, but they're part of what makes government work best, and I think that's been a lot of progress over the last decade. I'll always remember we wrote a report um, called Breaking Down Bureaucratic Barriers, the next wave of e-government, I think it was called, and, and I got an email after that report came out from an, uh, a group in a, in a department I won't name, and they were, um, they were saying, you, you, we were really disappointed that you didn't feature our web application because it's such a fantastic thing and it allows this certain group of people to access this certain group of services. And I looked at it and I said, well, this certain group of people, there are services in nine different departments that they want to access and you have yours in your department and yours is very, very good, but it doesn't have even other programs in the same department. And that to me goes to your challenge, which is everybody loves their their agency and wants to optimize it, but because there's a special, no one else is as special. So I wonder if it goes back to the, the we've heard a lot about the interagency fund and how there was real hope for that. When we wrote about that initially, I, I, 12 years ago, I'm hoping I can remember it right, but as I recall, uh, the Canadians had a fund like that. The Canadian CIO had a serious yes, fund, and as I recall, yeah. it was $500 million on a, the same level of per GDP. Of Canada's a smaller country, but it, it would scale it to the same level in the US. It would have been $500 million, massively more. It, it, should we revisit that? Does it make sense to try to take a tax on all the agency IT budgets and put it into over the OMB? So there's going to be varying thoughts from everybody in here. And as a person who lived under the, the least amount of money in that fund. I actually think 
that because we had we did not have that money available because that's all almost the field of dreams approach build it and they shall come what's to me what is the incentive for the agency to to actively contribute or actively participate or where's their skin in the game if they're not if somebody else is building it because we you know good better and different we have professional meeting goers in departments and agencies and may not necessarily be tied up to the leadership like what you're saying where they have one that's really good and they haven't tied it into the other nine components when you are contributing the way that it was initially set up now whether that was right or wrong but when you were contributing what made all of these work is um, Congress demanded from OMB first off that we weren't impounding funds so we had to have a lot of transparency and, and where the accounts were that were coming from this and then the agencies had skin in the game because you were taking money away from accounts that had like functions like in this case if there were nine different components that had the same function OMB tapped into all nine of those and said a portion of that's going over here because this is what we're doing and um, you're not going to build anything new you're going to contribute over here because this is the one-stop shop for the citizen, and you're going to migrate and put plans in place that are going to shut this down. That made it work because then other concepts that were in the E-Government uh, Act, like the enterprise architecture and what the federal government should look at and how you should line up all these things, that was all outlined in statute, building upon what was in Klinger Cohen. It made agencies really think about that and said, boy, if you're going to take my money, I want something for it. And Congress was like, if you're going to use the agency's money that I appropriated for this particular um, purpose, then I want accountability for that too. And so it did force a lot of the transparency that Bill was talking about so that everybody could see what was going on. Now, whether they agreed with it or not is a different topic, and there were hearings, a lot of hearings on those. But it did force everybody to come to the table to talk about what they wanted that outcome to look like. Okay, great. Now, I'm gonna open, let's open it up for some comments or questions from uh, the audience. If you have a comment, if you just want to raise your hand and identify yourself. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, how much of this can be done with online transparent meetings uh, between the affected parties? Uh, yeah, uh, we actually tried to, in our original draft, there was a fair amount about establishing participatory forums. Um, some of those actually involve citizens. I guess it depends on what source of participation you're talking about. You see that so much more than you would have um, uh, back in 2001. Uh, in, in every sphere of government, you see things happening online. There's just so much more transparency. If, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if, if, if this administration is spending money on something, they're, they're putting up a, a website tracking where all that money goes. Uh, you, every congressional committee and subcommittee has a has a website so that you can, in which they have archived hearings. Um, uh, trans, transparency is a key part of the government act. Uh, but when you talk about participatory forum, um, if there's not a government structure in place for how that, that input is accepted, for example, regulations.gov is essentially taking process that was very hidden and was only available to people who had lawyers under the regulatory law. It, but the rules are the same. The rules are you submit written comments a particular way. What's different now is you can do it from home and you can see what other people have submitted prior to the close, closing of the, of the rulemaking process. When, when we did our online legislative interactive tool, people were objecting because they were saying, well, how do you even know they're Americans? Um, which was true, anyone could, could have submitted a, a comment. Um, there were people from the federal government, just individual federal employees, who were submitting comments on legislation and that made OMB nervous um, because uh, you can't have an individual federal employee commenting on this proposed legislation. So in the end, OMB um, got a working group together and uh, got all of the agencies to submit a single set of comments onto our tool, which was really just a supposed to be an informal tool for us to solicit dialogue of interest. Um, so uh, I, 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 think, um, I think that's that's a goal for the future, is to encourage greater citizen input. Um, certainly comments, um, engagement, you're seeing that now, you're seeing online petitions um, on the White House website, which is, which is a new thing. 
and then and, but you have to establish government processes and then for how how do we gauge this input and measure it and structure it. And I would agree that's really part of the next phase, if you will. If there's been experimentation under regulations.gov, there have been some online interactive participatory meetings of the kind that your question describes, and I think you'll probably see, to Kevin's point, more of that in terms of not only regulatory development, but also potentially policy process involvement of citizens over time at all levels of government. And a lot of other smaller governments have moved a lot further. <coughs> Iceland wrote their new constitution through a very participatory process. Estonia has a process in place where you, citizens can put up ideas, and if a certain number of other people vote for them, then they have to be looked at. A variety of governments have those in place. But I do think yeah, the, it, it's, it's hard to get it right in the bigger story. I remember when they first started opening up the comments and regulations that Gov and got 275,000 at one point for a small little agriculture thing and so sort of dealing with that. But now, of course, that's where we can use more advanced technology, um, text analytics and other sort of things to sort through that stuff uh, very, very quickly. But I do I agree with you, Dan, that I think um, policy is going to be the one area that one thing I would just uh, wanted to point out uh, in terms of customer centric, I actually think that the, the biggest gains we're seeing right now are due to the open data movement. Um, what the administration's done around open data, where they just put you know so many data sets out there, and we we're seeing you know hundreds of or if you listen to Todd Park, maybe billions of dollars worth of um, data being put out there, and entrepreneurs who are developing really great applications in the healthcare arena and the transit arena and all sorts of other ones. And that's that's how we interact with technology today through apps and so forth. And so I think that's the movement that's going to be the most powerful as opposed to necessarily trying to get 26 agencies always to play well together. Just a couple of points. One, Bill, you mentioned <coughs> Estonia, which believe it or not, has a model on, on many, many things IT. One of the reasons Estonia can do that is they actually have close to 100% digital signature adoption among their adult citizens and so they actually vote on national elections on the internet because they can authenticate that you are a citizen who has the right to vote uh, we're nowhere near um, having that ability <clears throat> we did a report recently on digital signature adoption around the world and it's striking how far back we are but the second point bill is, is I think is the data innovation and so the power behind all of the data that the federal government has is I think very very striking and there's really no way to no way to predict that back in 2002. Um, we didn't really have <clears throat> this notion of big data sets at all. We're doing, uh, ITIF is hosting on January 24th uh, an event called Data Innovation Day. If you just go online and search for Data Innovation Day, you'll see it, where we're trying to highlight the, the real uh, benefits of innovation around data, both in the private and the public sector. Next, uh, yeah. Uh, wait for the mic. Maggie Hanna, uh, advisor to the World Bank. Uh, I'm curious to know uh, if they have you know, been following up or doing any studies about how other countries uh, are measuring productivity enhancement from the government and whether there are some different practices in this area. And in relation to that, not only in terms of productivity within government, but really how much value it is contributing to citizens and to business, because really that may be the largest uh, amount of benefits. <coughs> Bill, you want to do that? I mean, I, I haven't actually found a lot of governments that have done necessarily a, a great job in tracking that. As I said, some governments that do require a productivity dividend were kind of a give back to the equivalent of the finance ministry uh, so forth each year. Um, and I, I, I think it's a great question around what the benefits to the private sector, to the society at large from a lot of this. I, I developed a model a number of years ago where I called Creating Citizen Advantage, which actually looked at the government applications and said, how much time does this save, and then what might it actually be worth? Um, and I think that's actually, some of the numbers there can be pretty powerful, uh, but no governments have felt the need that they had to like necessarily go through all of that. But I think certainly around like things like building inspection and regulation and a lot of those areas, you can dramatically reduce the friction between government and the private sector, government and citizens, which can then, you know, we, we know what an hour of their time, so their time is worth. So it's, the, the math is pretty easy on that, but I haven't seen a government try to systemically go about that. Have you, have you Dan? No, I know a few years ago the OECD had a number of 
cross comparative studies in this area uh, in their work program. I haven't seen them updated uh, since then. So I had to get my driver's license renewed. It was my birthday about a month ago, and I went there the day before it was expired, and I started to count the number of people and the average weight and then ascribe a $10 an hour to their time. And I got to a very, very large number very, very quickly. And I guarantee you that Maryland DMV does not count the wasted time and the value of that of, of a Maryland citizen, nor do I doubt the federal government does that or any state does that. And if we did that, we would get, I think, a lot more IT implementation because it's the, the business case. Karen, well, I was going to say, on. actually, there are some agencies that actually calculate that. So, for example, IRS does it um, when they're doing their customer service. So that this administration took and um, went further with customer satisfaction, customer satisfaction rates. And so the time spent in a line um, where there are things very transactional, like IRS, where you have to go get forms, or you call on the phone, or you're doing a bunch of different things like that, they actually have that quantified. Um, you, know, you have labor that has that quantified. You have Social Security Administration, who has been doing this for years, who actually has an efficiency rate built into what they have to do for their appropriations and, um, and have to uh, gain a certain efficiency every year in order to manage their cost structure. So some of the agencies that are very transactional based like that, that interact directly with the citizen, actually do have models in place where they can do it. What is hard is trying to extrapolate that across the board, for example, um, in a counterterrorism area. You can, but it's, it's just a little bit longer to validate the, the cost of those. Well, just to that point, I mean, I, I, I thinking about IRS, I noticed last year that I, I could not get the form I needed online, and I had to call an IRS office and have it mailed to me. And I thought, are you kidding me? Mailing me a form? And I, there was, I think, an effort to count the number, of, I know people have talked about it, count the number of forms that are not in digital format. And I don't know if that's gone anywhere. Have we ever done that? Have we? Well, you could actually ask GSA, not that I have all this stuff memorized, however, Pueblo, Colorado, they actually measure the forms, and so GSA still does a distribution if somebody wants it in paper. And so some of the forms and all those other things like that, um, they really do try to track this, but I'm going to steal something from Congressman Davis in the case of IRS. The um, improvements, whether it comes from the appropriators or who is watching them, there is there is no competition for you to get that IRS form unless you're going to, you know, a taxpayer or H and R Block or something along the lines like that, right? And so there was a whole nother model that was started under Mark's leadership that. Um, really kind of try to capitalize on that, the IRS Free File Alliance, that then incentivized the people that were doing stuff in the marketplace to actually start providing that service so that it could decrease what was happening with the IRS and reduce their overall operating costs. There's one, one agency to look at uh, a little bit on this is the EPA. EPA is one of the first federal agency that I know of that have moved towards what it called the mobile first policy. <coughs> What that means, they said, our customers are all on mobile devices. That's where people access uh, government more than laptops or more desktops today. And so we're going to design all of our web applications. We're going to design everything based on a mobile, a mobile device. And um, so they're going to use that as the, the starting off first. Because what so many agencies do is they'll divide, they'll develop the applications and everything based on a, on a desktop model. And how you interact mobile is so much different. And then they'll try to switch it over. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense today. So I think you, we're going to see a number of agencies do that, and you're going to see a much more kind of a, a better look and feel, but a much more easy to interact than with government as they figure out the kind of how people interact in, in a mobile world. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, well, uh, we're at, a, at our stopping point for the first panel. I um, want to do two things. Uh, first of all, I want to thank this great panel, first of all, for your leadership in, in, in drafting the bill and getting it implemented and then implementing it and then also uh, free time here. So if I could, we could thank the first panel and then I ask the second panel.